Go ahead, grab your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 17. Second week in a row here that we're able to just spend time in half a chapter, which is much more pleasant than flying through two or three at a time like we'd been doing uh, a few weeks before that. So uh, here we are, uh, Acts 17. Um, as you're turning there, we are, we're blessed in this church, I think at least, to have such a wonderful, talented group of musicians, right? That just kind of week in, week out, lead us in worship, absolutely. So this, this illustration won't make any sense to us, but just imagine for a moment that you're coming in all set to worship and the, the band is jamming out and everybody is playing very well together in the key of G, except for one person who is playing in the key of A flat would undoubtedly be Robert, I'm sure, right? If it were going to be anybody, that's right. And so that, you know, it's going to, it's going to take away from the worship experience, right? I mean, even though we know it's not really about the music, it's about our heart, it's still going to be jarring and unpleasant, probably more than a little distracting, right? And we, we would want to deal with it. We want to do something to, to, to address this. And we're going to go up to Robert and say, hey, buddy, you know, we're, we're playing in G today, man. Can you scoot your capo over, right? You just, what you're playing is great, you just got to transpose it into the right key so that it fits with what's surrounding it, right? And that's what we're talking about this morning. That's it exactly. As we look at what it means to do mission in context, there's this sense that, okay, there's, there's something surrounding us, and we got to make sure that we get the gospel into the right key so that it makes sense for the context that it's in. That's what we're going to see in Paul's example here. This is a famous passage of Scripture because it's such a different place. We've, we've seen Paul preach quite a few sermons now, right? But he keeps preaching them in synagogues. And so they, they've started to sound a little bit the same. Well, he's not in the synagogue anymore. He, he's somewhere else. He's in pagan Athens, and, and he's uh, at the Areopagus, where he's talking to a group of Greek philosophers who... Well, I mean, let's think about the context for a little bit. These Greek philosophers, for as bright as they are, they're going to have absolutely no knowledge of the Bible, Right? I mean, no idea who Abraham is, David is, Moses, don't know, don't care, right? Uh, an extremely tolerant uh, group of people, inclusive, right? I mean, that's going to be one of their uh, uh, virtues for sure. In fact, uh, a strong commitment to religious pluralism. As we're going to see, Paul's going to walk around and he's going to see idol after idol after idol. I mean, we're worshiping any god, any god we hear of, fine, we'll build a temple. That's cool. Everybody's welcome, right? This is the context that he's in. Very different from the Jewish monotheism that he's encountering when he goes to the synagogue. So radically different context. And of course, everything I just said, much more similar to our context now, right? I mean, almost everything I said makes sense of us today. The virtues of tolerance, Inclusivism, commitment to religious pluralism, and then, of course, the, the no Bible knowledge. There was a time, uh, you know, 50 years ago, when this part of the building was built, for example, you probably could have grabbed most people off the street and they would have been able to tell you the Ten Commandments. Hey, maybe struggle with some. They get most of them at least, right? Probably even get them close to in order. Well, I mean, I've worked with kids who've not only grown up in Christian homes, in church, but also in Christian schools. 18 years couldn't tell me the Ten Commandments. Never mind, in order, anything like that, right? Grab somebody off the street. Again, they're going to get some. They probably know thou shalt not kill. But they're not going to get all ten, right? So we're, we're dealing with people who have a radically different understanding of Scripture, much less understanding of what Scripture says. So what do we do in this context? There's lots to learn from Paul's example in this passage. So we're going to look at. So as we get there, we're going to focus especially on our personal witness. And, and so I want to kind of lay the groundwork by reading a quote from Jonathan Dodson in uh, his book, The Unbelievable Gospel. It came out last year, actually one book of the year in Christianity Today. And uh, he, he addresses this theme very directly. And he has some very strong words about how we have done evangelism in this context. Okay, So they're strong. We're going to kind of unpack them as we go today. Here's what he has to say. He says, evangelism is something many Christians are trying to recover from. The word stirs up memories of rehearsed presentations, awkward door-to-door witnessing, and forced conversions in revival-like settings. To be certain, God may use these efforts, but not as much as is often claimed. In fact, these forms of evangelism have actually created an impediment to evangelism. Wave after wave of rationalistic, rehearsed, and at times coerced and confrontational evangelism has inoculated, 
if not antagonized, the broader culture. Though it is unintentional, modern forms of evangelism have generated gospel witness that is impersonal, preachy, intolerant, and uninformed about the real questions people ask. And you see what he's saying there is just, we're singing in A-flat, and the culture's in G, and it's not working. It's jarring and unpleasant. We've got to learn our context well so that we can present the gospel in ways that make sense in that context. So we've got three steps before we get there, okay? Three steps before we can speak the gospel personally. Love, listen, look. We're going to take a look at these uh, in Paul's example here. So love, uh, just to get us going, Acts 17, as I said, just verse 16 to start with. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And you're going, okay, don't see the love there. It makes sense. I'm with you on this one, but it's just not there in that passage. It, it, it comes out in that phrase, greatly distressed. Okay, Paul was greatly distressed. It's a very strong word in Greek. In fact, it's where we get our word paroxysm from. So, you know, Paul's going apoplectic as he's walking around the city. Like, that's what's happening here. There's this big emotion attached to him. In fact, the word that's used shows up in another very famous passage of Scripture, Hebrews 10, 24, where the writer to Hebrews says, let us consider then how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. That word spur is the exact same word as this word distressed here. I mean, what, is a, what does a spur do? What is the writer of Hebrews talking about? He's talking about something that will provoke us to action, right? And that's what a spur is. You jab a spur into the side of a horse, and the horse is going to go, I should do something, right? And so what is it that's going to provoke us to action, to get to the point where we go, I've got to do something here? That's what Paul is talking about. And it's love that does it, right? Let me give you an easy example. Suppose that you had a loved one, someone very dear to you, who was getting caught up in serious drug addiction. Right? I mean, addicted to heroin, something like that. And you're watching it destroy their lives. Probably not just their lives, but the lives of those around them as well. You're going to start stealing from people to pay for the habit. They're fracturing relationships all over the place. It would be devastating, and it would certainly provoke you to action, right? You're not going to sit back and watch this happen. You're going to do something about it. You would be greatly distressed. Exactly what Paul feels here. So what is it that provokes Paul? Why does he care? It's because he loves the people of Athens. Doesn't know them personally, and yet still loves them. And wants the best for them. And that's why he's provoked to action. If you're at all like me, you find motivation for evangelism difficult to come by, right? Like, it's, it's hard. It's awkward. I don't want to do it. Nothing in me goes, you know what, I'd really like to have a conversation about Jesus with somebody right now. Like, I'm just going out, like, we're hitting Starbucks after church so I can do this. That's not me, at least. Some of you are like that, I know. Most of you are not, though. You're with me on this one. I know that. So we, we need something to provoke us, right? We need something to provide us with that motivation. And what is it going to be? It's when we become distressed because those we love are perishing and need the good news of the gospel, and if we're not feeling distressed, I would argue that probably one of the issues is that we don't know any unbelievers well enough to care about them. And so what this may mean for us is that we need to get out of our holy huddle a little bit. Right? Like I'm just surrounded by Christians all day long. I go to church. They're my friends. I work at a Christian organization or something like that. I need to get to know some people, care enough about them that I then feel this sort of distress, so that I have the motivation there. We've got to be intentional about this. So that's the first piece, love. And then the next one, uh, listen. Let's keep reading, verses 17 to 21. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him, brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? 
You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas, which again just sums up that context very nicely. So, uh, Paul loves these people. What does he do next? He listens to them. But that's not exactly how Luke puts it. He says, at verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue. So where am I getting the listening from? It's, it's because the word for reason, we've we got to remember how Greeks reason back then. The word is dialegomai, which you can almost hear our word dialogue in there, right? That's where we get our word dialogue from. Because when the Greeks reasoned, they reasoned the way Socrates did. It's kind of a big name in Greek philosophy, right? And what is the Socratic method? It's a question and answer format, right? So there's this back and forth. There's this dialogue that takes place. And you can see evidence of it uh, in their conversation, right? Verse 18, he debates with them. And again, a debate is not a monologue. It's, it's, there's some back and forth, right? And we've got a lot of debates going on in the country, so you see what this looks like. And, and then at 19 and 20, you see them asking questions. So again, there's, there's this conversation that's taking place. So what it doesn't say is that Paul preached at them. No, it doesn't say that at all. He engaged in real, two-way conversation with them, which is a lost art generally in society, but certainly a lost art when it comes to evangelism. But here's the thing. When we engage in real conversation, we learn what's going on inside of somebody. We can actually get to hear their heart. to to know where they are, and then we can minister the gospel personally to them. And that's what the goal is. Proverbs 20, verse 5 says this, The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. It's a wonderful verse, isn't it? It's a great verse for parents in particular, and I would say even more specifically parents of teenagers. Teenagers, not famous for... Right. Famous for depth, a lot of feeling, emotion there. Not famous for bringing that to the surface real often. What is a parent's, uh, one of the primary jobs is to draw them out what's going on in your heart, right? Well, that's what we're supposed to be doing in these conversations as well. What's really going on inside of you? There's, there's a depth there that I need to know, and I need to know profoundly, because then I can address real concerns, right? Real needs that are felt by the person, or, to keep going with my metaphor, right, I can transpose the gospel into its proper key so that I'm not speaking in A-flat when their concerns are in G. As you do this, then, last step, you're constantly observing, looking for opportunities, looking for openings where you can share the gospel. That's the last step. Look. Uh, verses 22 and 23. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. You can see all these sight verbs that are getting used in these two verses, right? He says, I see that you are very religious. You're so religious, in fact, that you're going, there may be a God out there that we don't even know anything about, and we want to make sure he's given, you know, due reverence, due worship. And so we're going to build an altar to this guy, and probably deeper than that, there probably it was even this sense that there's something ultimate behind all of these gods that they worship. Most Greeks uh, were uh, believed the myths to be very useful stories that would, uh, would produce character in, in their culture, but didn't necessarily believe that these gods really existed. So there was this sense of the ultimate capital U behind it, and that's really what this altar is for. And, and that's what he, he sees as he walks around, right? He, he observes this in the culture and sees that it's going to be an opening for a gospel conversation, you know, to, to scratch where they itch, so to speak. In the same way, we, as we're loving people, forming deep relationships with them, listening to them as we engage in real conversation with them, we're, we might see some things too, right? We might see a, a deep desire for change, Somebody who's caught in, in destructive patterns that they, they know they don't want to be in but just can't seem to get out of. Or we might see somebody who's racked by guilt because of past decisions and just can't seem to move past it. And we might hear some 
cognitive dissonance going on. You ever had a conversation with somebody and you, you talk to them often enough that you kind of go, well, you believe A and you believe B, and A and B are mutually exclusive and you don't seem to care about that. And this is something that we might actually be able to talk about. You're going to hear somebody, see in somebody a, a longing for intimacy, right? for connection, to be, to be a part of a community. And these are all places where we can go, okay, Right? The gospel has something to say to this. There's, there's truth that we can bring into this moment. So before we even speak the gospel personally, we're loving, listening, looking. Now we're going to spend some time looking at how uh, Paul speaks the gospel personally. But before we get there, I thought it would be useful uh, to bring Dave Fox up here. Dave, you want to start coming up? Uh, here's why. As I've uh, been talking to Dave over the past few months, uh, I hear this theme in his life. Okay, this is somebody who does relational evangelism well. Somebody who has gotten to know a lot of people, has invested very deeply in their lives, takes the time to get to know them well, uh, really does love and listen and look, and then has been able to share the gospel personally. So you got a story for us from your past few months here. Can you share with us how uh, you, you, you got to this point? Loving somebody, uh, listening to them, looking at their lives, so that then when it came time to share the gospel, you could do it in the right key, so to speak. Right. Um, I am not one of those guys that can take a stack of the sport for spiritual laws or some uh, tool like that and just head out on the street and just say, okay, today I'm going to put on this evangelism face and I'm going to go out and, and save people. Um, that's just not me. But I, I love people, uh, the people, my family, first of all, uh, the people I work with, and, and my neighbors. And so... Um, my my first um, my first step on this road of being able to share the gospel with these people is just building an authentic, loving relationship with them. And again, it's not like putting on like, okay, today I've got to look for someone and like build a relationship with them. It's just living life on life with the people that are in in my world. And as a pilot, I spend a lot of time with. A pilot sitting next to me, hour after hour after hour, right? And in my neighborhood, I spend a lot of time with people in my neighborhood, right? They're walking their dog, or we're shoveling together, or picking up leaves together. Or, you know, those are people that are kind of in my lives, that uh, my life that I have a, a chance to get to know better. And one person stands out in in the context of Brandon's ser- sermon, and his name is Brandon, as a matter of fact. And he was my first officer in the cockpit for years, really. And we had hours and hours of conversation. And at some point along the way, uh, Brandon learned that I was a believer, someone who had put my faith in Jesus Christ and was living a life for for Jesus. And so... um, I think of a song that's on Caleb quite a bit, <clears throat> Let My Life Song Sing For You, right? We've heard that. And so I desire for my life song to sing for him. But it's not like a, I got to turn it on. I just want my life to live for Jesus, right? In the cockpit with Brandon. And so a couple years later, now he's a captain. We're not flying together. He comes up to me and says something like, Dave, I just feel like maybe I want to start on a spiritual journey. And could we talk about it sometime? Now, that's kind of the easy route, right, when somebody comes to you, but that happened because there was a relationship, a love relationship building between Brandon and myself. It wasn't pushed. It just was happening in conversation through the years. And I said, I'd love to, but, you know, now we can only talk so much now. What do you say we get together sometime? So we met at a Panera, across the table from each other, and I just listened where he was in his life, with his marriage, with his adoptive child, and becoming a captain, and just where he was in life, and started to learn more about him on this more intimate level, right? You see how it's kind of growing? And um, then our conversation moved to where he was kind of thinking about spiritual things and so forth. And so we made it to a certain point in that first time, and then we made another time to meet the same Panera a couple weeks later. This time... Uh, I, I bought a Bible, had his name engraved in it, and I bought The Purpose Driven Life. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I bought this Bible at the uh, bookstore, the family bookstore, this woman knew the story. 
it's just a touching story. And she knew I was buying it for this guy named Brandon. And after she inscribed it, she held it in front of me and she said, let's pray over this Bible that you're going to give to Brandon. Can you feel that moment? And she just stood there in front of me and prayed over this Bible that I was going to give to Brandon. And so we met next time, and um, I, I said, could we, like, if you wanted to be a, a great athlete or a great this, you'd probably need a coach. And it sounds like you want to start in this spiritual journey. Could I be your, like, life coach for a few months, like your spiritual life coach, and we could work together and learn together? And so that's how this relationship began, and there's more to it. There's an end of this story, but I wanted to just kind of share how, how that worked with Brandon. And um, I wanted to emphasize it's really important that we as believers to establish this relationship and for it to kind of work right and be easy is when we're right with God, this vertical is really good between us and God. And the Spirit's really working in our lives. It's then easy for us to be loving and authentic with those people that we have an opportunity to talk with. Did I cover everything okay, Brandon? Covered everything well. Okay, good. So, yeah, he mentioned there's an end to that story, and that's that I stopped being a pilot and became a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the end of that story, but uh, equally exciting, just the same. Thank you, Dave. Really appreciate that. So, again, just to kind of drive home this point, the the legwork that takes place before all of this. I'm not saying that there's never a moment where you don't share the gospel first time out, right? Sensitivity to the Spirit, sometimes that happens, absolutely. More often than not, though, it's going to happen in this context, right? In the context of relationship. In fact, if I were to do a quick show of hands, we're going to do this next week, so you don't have to do it right now. How many people came to faith in Christ because of a relationship with a believer? I would guess it would be more than 90% of this church. We'll see next week. Come back for the exciting conclusion. Um, All right. But so once this relationship is placed, then we can speak the gospel personally. And we're going to look at uh, uh, how this looks as we we keep reading. So let me uh, read Paul's uh, sermon if you will, this this gospel presentation that he gives, uh, verse 24 to the end of the chapter. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead." When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. All right, so here's where we see Paul now having transposed the gospel into its proper key, right? And in this case, what we're going to see is he he directly engages with this group of philosophers who are are all going to be members of either uh, the Stoics or the Epicureans, right? These two major branches of Greek philosophy. So Paul knows this, knows his context. He's, he's loved, he's looked, and especially he's listened to them share their beliefs, and now he's able to speak the gospel personally. And, and look at how this works. Look at what Paul doesn't share in contrast to some of the other sermons we've, we've heard him give. Nothing about the temple. Nothing about any sacrifices, any sacrificial imagery or anything like that. Right? I, no Abraham... David, Moses, anything. Uh, No Messiah, in fact, right? No son of David that's coming. No Old Testament quotes in the slightest. No reference to the kingdom. This is interesting because we've come across all of those quite a few times in Acts already in Paul's sermon. And yet he's doing something differently. Why, Why doesn't he share any of that? Isn't this important information for them to know? Yeah, absolutely. But not then. 
He doesn't share this because everything he could have said about that would be absolutely meaningless to them. Just useless at this point in the conversation. Because it would be insider language. You know, if you're going to go, Jesus is the Christ, and they're going to go, don't know who Jesus is, don't know what Christ means. No interest in what you are saying. Insider language just alienates and confuses. It does nothing to foster understanding and Let's face it, there needs to be understanding in order for there to be a response to the gospel. We can do this today, can't we? Do Christians have insider language? A little bit, yeah, here and there. You know, because of your iniquities, you need to be justified, you've got to be washed in the blood, sanctified by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, born again so that you can live unto Christ. Look, all of that was very meaningful to me, and probably meaningful to quite a few of you also, although some of those words like justified and sanctified are less and less meaningful even to Christians. But imagine talking to somebody who's got no Bible knowledge whatsoever. I mean, just speaking gibberish might as well have gone to the Greek words I was talking about earlier. They're going to mean just as much. All of those words are going to be useless at this point. At some point, do I hope people learn what justification and sanctification mean? Yeah. That's why we talk about them on Sunday mornings, and I try to define them even. Not right now, because that's not the point. But at some point, we'll define them, right? We do it. But useless at this point. So where does Paul begin instead? He begins with creation, because that was a a point of contact, something that the the Greeks would have agreed with him. So he begins there and says, all right, if we agree on this point, let's consider some of the implications of this belief. And then this is the really interesting part. He doesn't quote the Bible, because they don't care about the Bible. What does he quote instead? Their own poets, two Greek poets. Epimenides, this Cretan poet that he'll actually quote again uh, with Titus at a a later date. And then the really interesting one is he quotes Eratus, who is a Stoic philosopher. You you think that's a point of contact? You think there's going to be some understanding now? There's going to be some conversation that can take place? And think about what this says about Paul, too. How well he knows his culture, his context, that he's able to quote from that culture at will in relevant ways. And we have not always been good at that as the church, have we? We like our little enclaves, right? We're going to do our own little culture. We're going to watch Left Behind movies instead of the movies the other people watch because then we know they're Christian. Now there's no language that we can use to speak to them. But Paul does this, and again, quoting a Stoic philosopher, I think of how rhetorically persuasive that would be. To say, like, I'm talking about you guys. Like, your own people are saying this. And let's consider these implications. Like, I read an article this week that was critiquing the Darwinian view of evolution uh, and was doing so by looking at the fossil record and what one person in particular thought about the fossil record. And the guy they quoted was Darwin. (laughs) So you're going to quote Darwin to critique Darwin. That's going to be a little bit more persuasive than quoting Genesis to critique Darwin, right? This is what Paul is able to do here. So he says, look, we we agree, God made us. We are his offspring. We exist because of and even in him. Well, what implications follow from that? Well, for one thing, it means he doesn't need us. Right? We don't, uh, Greek thinking with sacrifice would be almost like you were feeding the God. And so if you don't do this, God's, you know, going to be losing out on something. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Right? Doesn't need, he made us, he doesn't need us. And then the idols that you're making out of gold and silver, wood and stone and stuff, well, those can't be real. If he made us, we don't then get to make him. That would be a really bad chicken and the egg scenario, right? Like somebody's got to come first, and it's God, and we all agree about this. And this God, of which they were confessing ignorance when they built this altar to an unknown God, well, Paul says he's not overlooking that ignorance anymore. A day of judgment is coming, and the proof of that is the resurrection of Christ, which we spent quite a bit of time on last week. And the resurrection, him bringing the resurrection in, that's an important moment in his gospel witness because the resurrection addresses both Stoicism and Epicureanism. It directly criticizes both. I've said this before. The resurrection is so important because it reminds us that both flesh and spirit matter. And Christianity is the only worldview that says both of these matter. 
All right, and again, the resurrection is a proof of this because, of course, we uh, exist in spiritual you know, form. The Spirit exists eternally, but we're raised still physically. Christ himself was raised physically, like eight fish after the resurrection, all that kind of stuff. Christ exists in bodily form even now. So this is important. Spirit and matter matter. But this is a little different from these two Greek philosophies. So let's start with Epicureanism. Uh, they were... They believed in gods, believed gods existed, but they were so far removed from humanity that they really functioned as atheists. Okay, so there's no interaction with any supernatural realm. Believed that we were just matter, which means we exist for, you know, 70 or so years, and then we die, we go in a box, we decompose, that's the end of us, right? There's nothing, no part of us that exists eternally. And so how do you respond to that? Well, you've got to find some way to overcome your fear of death then, because you don't exist eternally. And how are you going to do that? Well, by living a life of pleasure. You know, a life of, of pleasure. They defined pleasure differently than we might today, because, of course, this view is pretty strong today, right? It's like the existentialism that came out of the 1960s and stuff that, that's is still around. But it looked a little bit similar today, even, especially because of uh, the way they spoke of sexual freedom. Right? The, the need for sexual pleasure to kind of overcome this fear of death and make uh, life worthwhile. Which, if I can just brief aside here, this is bonus material, but uh, y- y- you hear occasionally that the Bible's view of sex is outdated, right? But you've got to remember that the Bible, uh, the New Testament, was written in, in a culture that held exactly the view of sex that our culture holds now. And Christianity flourished in that environment because it spoke a deeper truth. Because we'll see, of course, I mean, the Epicureans, uh, what did they find? That their unrestrained pursuit of sexual pleasure didn't lead to fulfillment. It never does, right? It led to a greater emptiness. Because they weren't actually finding true intimacy. They were finding very temporary physical pleasure. And so something like the resurrection coming along and, and speaking of the importance and the eternality of the body, I mean, that just... That racked their worldview. And it was so appealing. And even this more restrained view of sexuality that the, the, the Bible um, supports, this, this, was, this was deeply appealing to them. And of course, the fear of death overcome as well. And then there's Stoicism. So if the Epicureans focus on the body... Uh, the Stoics had the opposite problem. They would focus on the spirit. The Stoics, of course, kind of famous for having no emotion. Uh, why is that? Well, the Stoics had this view of, of the world um, that, that saw God in everything, the divine in everything, kind of like pantheism uh, today, a little almost New Age spirituality, something like that. God in everything, which meant there was this order and this harmony in the universe, and your goal was to kind of try and bring your life into harmony with the harmony that exists. So there was this huge focus on the universe. How do you say universe in Greek? Cosmos. Okay, well now, we get cosmos from the Greek. What's the other word that comes from cosmos that we use in the English language a lot? Cosmetics. Well, where did those two come together, right? Like, I get cosmos means universe. How did we get to makeup in the universe? Well, because the cosmos is ordered, is beautiful, is in harmony... And so cosmetics became the study of order and beauty and harmony, and then eventually came to mean the things you use to cover up any disorder, ugliness, you know, disharmony, that kind of thing, and so it became makeup. So this is who the Stoics are. But so here's the problem with their focus on this, these spiritual principles, this harmony and stuff, it led to a, a cold abstraction, which again is what the Stoics are famous for, no emotions, just coldness. And part of that was because they couldn't really deal with the way life works. Is there order and beauty and harmony in the universe? Absolutely. Is there a lot of disorder, disharmony, a lot of ugliness and pain and suffering in the universe? Yeah, absolutely. You've got to have a worldview that's going to deal with that too. And the Stoics couldn't, right? And so they just had to, well, just squash the emotion, just everything will be set right, you know, everything will come back into line with harmony. Paul comes along preaching the resurrection, Going, look, your cold abstractionism isn't going to work. What you need is a relationship with a gracious creator. That's going to get past the cold abstraction. You don't need a, a relationship with spiritual principles. You need a relationship with the spirit of the living God. And then we can talk about a resurrection 
Well, now we're talking about God making all things new, setting the whole world right. So we can acknowledge that so much of what we see in the world isn't in harmony, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. Right? But that God is going to do something about that. Eventually, the resurrection is the first fruits of God setting all things right. So the resurrection addresses both. And now, considering how much of Epicureanism and really even Stoicism we see in the world today, the cold rationality and stuff, you have to wonder if if there's something to be learned from Paul here, too. This is, again, more bonus material for you. But I find in our time in Acts here, we've seen that the biblical writers, and, and as they're preaching the gospel, they turn to the resurrection a lot more often than we do, right? We preach about Christ on the cross, and hear me very carefully here. I'm not saying we should speak less of Christ's death, only that we should speak more of his resurrection. I think it will address where our culture is at this point uh, in a deep, deep way. Well, it's not surprising then, because of what I just said, how the resurrection just just racks Stoicism and Epicureanism, just we're going to rock it to the core, that this is the moment that sparks the outrage, right? He, he just says the word resurrection, and boom, uh, immediately the audience divides into the same three camps that you're always going to find any time you share the gospel. Some sneer, all done, walls go up, eyes glaze over, no more conversation to be had. Some go, okay, that blew my mind. Like, we're going to have to talk about this again. All right? I'm not there, but I'm interested. I'm intrigued, right? And some, like Dionysius and Damaris, believe. And that's, uh, you know, not, again, not surprising that the resurrection is what brings us there. So what is the challenge for us, then, coming out of this? If we could kind of sum it up. I, I see that there are two things that we need to know well in order to share the gospel personally. And they're right there in that phrase, even. We need to know the gospel and the person well, deeply, right? And we talked a lot about the person. That was that first part. But the gospel also, because Paul's able to speak the gospel in such relevant ways, right where these people are. Do we know the gospel well enough, the fullness of the gospel well enough, that we can choose the best way to bring it out in this conversation? The gospel, as I've said before, is this multifaceted jewel, Right? I mean, you can hold any angle you look at it. It is deep, profound, beautiful truth. Which facet would be the one most relevant in that person's life right then? You, you listen to somebody who's clearly seeking approval, probably still desperate for their dad's approval, truthfully, and they're trying to do it by you know, winning accomplishments at work or something like that. What do they need to hear? Maybe they need to hear about the gospel of adoption. Because that's approval right there. God himself, God the Father, says, I want you in my family. That's going to mess with your sense of approval, isn't it? That's going to give you a foundation to stand on. What if you're talking to somebody who's plagued by guilt because of past decisions? This is where that word justification would come in, right? Because what is justification? Justification is the legal declaration that we are not guilty. And more than that, it's not just that we're not guilty, but that we're actually righteous in Christ. All of his perfect life becomes ours. That's going to speak to that person, right? What if you talk to somebody who's trapped in sin? Again, these destructive patterns that they just can't get out of. They're not going to call it sin, but that's what it is, right? We want to talk about redemption, right? That Christ has purchased our freedom from slavery to sin. That there is a transforming power that comes with this. And maybe most deep of all, somebody who just wants to be loved, just yearning for this sort of intimacy. What could be more intimate than our union with Christ, that he himself would indwell us? We could have intimacy with God most high. We have to know the gospel well and the person well to bring these two together. i just share one example from my own life. I was speaking to a, a man, someone very dear to me, you know, years developing this relationship, know his heart very well, know his thinking very well, and he had... Um, a, kind of wrecked his life at this point, made some very poor choices that had finally caught up to him, and everything was just unraveling. And as I sat across from him at lunch, I had an opportunity here. I mean, he was very open to Jesus at this point, because he knew he needed something bigger than himself. 
Now, I could have gone a lot of ways here, right? Like, I could have spoken of justification, because clearly this guy had sinned, and there was penalty for his sin that needed to be addressed, but he didn't care about that. He was not feeling guilty. That was not what was on his mind right there. What was on his mind right then was hopelessness. He was looking at this going, I have messed everything up, and the worst part is, I've had time to fix it, and I couldn't. I didn't make the changes. Is, how am I ever going to change? And so I spoke to him what it means to be a new creation in Christ. When Christ has come, the old passes away. Everything's being made new. I was able to speak of my own life, some of my destructive patterns that God is undoing as he makes me new in Christ. And this spoke to him. I mean, he wasn't in that third category. He was in the middle one, where he went, okay, like this makes sense. I'm interested. I want to talk more. He didn't believe right then, but he didn't sneer either. Because the gospel made sense to him and transposed it into its proper key. Personalized, contextualized witness. Now I want to very quick, I know we've been long, but real quick before we close, I want to I deal with some corporate application as well. Because we've talked about personal witness, but this passage says a lot about us as an institution as well. The organization of the church. If I could say this, a failure to appreciate the changing context is what kills most churches that die. A failure to recognize that the context in which the church exists, the culture that surrounds it, has changed. That failure is what leads to the death of most churches. And as Pat Finney shared with us back in September, about 4,000 churches close each year. This is why, right here. So I read a a story just this week in the the book Autopsy of a Deceased Church, which I know uh, quite a few of you have read also, uh, and and it was this failure exactly, right? There's this church that just steady decline, had been 750 back in its heyday in the 60s, and just steady decline since then was down under 100 weekly attendance. There's a group of people in this church who were deeply committed to, not so much to the church, but to Christ and His glory. And so they wanted to reach the lost, and they brought some innovation in. And so they launched a contemporary service at, at the early hours, so a traditional service at 11. They launched a contemporary service at 8.30, Sunday school in between. And the contemporary service was, was actually drawing in people. There were people who were coming to know Christ through the ministry of this service, and it, and it started to grow. The problem, of course, the people that it was appealing to, younger generation tended to have little kids. 8.30 is really early on a Sunday morning for people with little kids, right? I've got a lot of you going, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's even harder when you get teenagers, guys. So, yeah, you know, this is what it is. So, so they asked, this group of people said, hey, can we switch the services? If I'm going to be blunt here for a moment, but the, the people who like the 11 o'clock traditional service, a little more flexibility in their time, Sunday mornings, right? So could have switched pretty easily, uh, came to a vote, right? And so this church that has an average attendance of like 85, 150 people showed up for the vote. Members coming out of the woodworks, members that they hadn't seen in five years, which says something about the church's membership process. But here they are, 150 of them at this vote, as soundly defeated, right? And that was it. That was the death knell for that church. The contemporary service closed that week. Church attendance dropped to 43 the next week. And those 43 people clung for dear life for another eight years before they finally closed up shop. No vitality. No one coming to know Christ. Why? Because there was a failure to understand the changing context in which that church existed. What does that mean for us? It means we need to reevaluate our ministry style, our ministry approach, constantly. Constantly, okay? Everything we do in the church will fall into one of three categories biblical, traditional, or contextual. Those are the only three options. So, biblical, what I mean by that is not just the principle, but the method itself is prescribed in Scripture. Let me give you a great example. This is like kind of weird, right? Like, who would say, you know what we should do? We should like eat crackers and drink juice together every month or so in church, right? Like, that's not, none of us are going to come up with that. That's not a contextual thing. But Jesus said, as often as you meet, do this until I come again. Okay, we're doing this then, right? This is biblical. We're going to do this. But most of what we do as a church doesn't fall into that neat little category. Do we need to open up the Word of God together every week? Yeah, absolutely. How exactly are you supposed to open up the Word of God every week? Verse by verse exposition? Can you do a topical sermon occasionally? Nothing in the Bible says anything about that, right? It's got to be biblical. That much we know. But otherwise, traditional 
or contextual. Music style, that's one we talk a lot about. Traditional or contextual. Kids programs. How do we reach the next generation? Is it Awana? Is it the Gospel Project? How are we going to do this? Traditional or contextual? Evangelistic methods, which we talked a lot about today. Not just personally, but corporately as well. Evangelism, explosion, four spiritual laws, these kinds of things. Traditional or contextual? Graphics, logos, names. What about facility, decoration, paint colors? Traditional or contextual? The challenge that we face as leaders in the church is the evaluation piece. Especially because as leaders in the church, we're the ones developing these ministries. They can become our babies really quickly. So constant evaluation. The challenge that you will face as congregants is change. Right? That's the hard piece. But here's the thing. Our delight in this God-centered mission allows us to relinquish our preferences and embrace innovation because we want to speak the unchanging truths of the gospel to a changing world in ways that they can understand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your gospel is timeless. The good news of what you did for us in Christ Jesus is good news at every time in every culture, every place, among every people. It is so rich in its depth, multifaceted. It speaks a good, it speaks not just a better, but the very best word in every situation. We know this, Lord. The challenge we face is how to speak that word in a way that is meaningful to those that you've entrusted to us, this community that you've given us to reach. Help us, Lord, to do our mission in this context well, because we delight more in your kingdom than we do in our preferences and the kingdoms we would build for ourselves. We ask this through Christ our Lord, because it is only by his strength that we will be able to do this. Amen and amen.